Hey folks, welcome back to our next lecture in this series uh, talking about the performance-based analysis of liquefaction hazard. And uh, as I mentioned in earlier videos, we're walking through all of the necessary background information for you to understand what we are doing when we talk about performance-based design. Uh, we've, we've already covered strong ground motions. We've covered the prediction of strong ground motions. We've covered seismic hazard analysis and some basics about soil liquefaction and the prediction of liquefaction triggering. And what I want to talk about in this brief lecture is a, a few of the more common and more serious effects associated with soil liquefaction and how we predict them. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and move through this material. So, um, liquefaction has numerous possible effects. Everything from loss of strength to, that could result in, in uh, failures of soil slopes, could result in bearing capacity failures of buildings and such. Um, it also involves often damage to retaining structures, it can change the, the ground motions that you feel at the site, at the ground surface. But two of the more common effects that we, uh, we see associated with liquefaction are seismic compaction. <coughs> uh, another more common term for this that we use today is, is just settlement, liquefaction-induced settlement. But um, as, as we'll see, there are numerous components to this settlement that we have to consider um, and, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And then um, lateral spread. Lateral spread is the horizontal deformation of the soil. So yeah, think of it this way. Seismic compaction or settlement is the vertical deformation of the soil due to liquefaction and lateral spread is the horizontal deformation of the soil due to lateral spread. So let's talk about seismic compaction first. Uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the most common effects with liquefaction settlement. And um, as the soil tries to contract and to squeeze out the poor water that, that's in it, uh, volumetric strains can occur in the soil. And now, technically, sand doesn't need to liquefy in order to experience these types of volumetric strains. In fact, there's quite a body of research that predicts seismic compaction in dry sands. So um, we can compute compaction in dry sands or in saturated sands. So um, I'm not saying that, that you should ignore and, and walk away from the seismic compaction in dry sands, but we're not going to talk about it in this brief lecture. We're only going to talk about volumetric strains in saturated sands. And it's very important to remember one thing that everything we're going to talk about in this lecture is really based on volumetric strains of saturated soils in the free field. So what does this mean? Let's go to the whiteboard. Uh, I'm not sure what's on the whiteboard. Ah, stuff from my last lecture. Nice. Okay. So here's the ground surface and here I have a liquefiable layer Let's just say the, the groundwater table is right there. Now, if what I mean by the free field is if earthquake motions come up and liquefy this sand layer right here, it's very likely that we're going to see some vertical deformations in this soil. And those vertical deformations are due to volumetric strain. Okay. So um, as those settlements occur in this ground surface, what we may end up seeing is that the ground shifts down such that now the ground surface is down there because everything tightened up in this uh, sand layer that liquefied. So that's a common occurrence. And this is what we mean by the free field is because it's literally a free field. Think about like old Farmer Joe's cornfield or something like that, right? We've got corn growing over here. Um, I've never sketched corn before, so bear with me. 
So, I mean, what, whatever you have, that, that just means that there's no infrastructure out there that could be applying any external loads to the soil. That's what we refer to as free field. But if we have a building that's located on the site, particularly if that building has, um, you know, of course, like every building does, it's going to have footings. Um, and the building is, is going to be supported by those footings. And so what ends up happening is we have a few other dynamics that can come into play. And um, some research by two really talented researchers, um, Shade Dashti, She's currently at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and then Jonathan Bray, her PhD advisor at uh, University of California at Berkeley. They were the first to really kind of observe some of these, these phenomena in centrifuge tests that they were doing, and they broke it out into a bunch of different components where the settlements were coming from. So if this building were to settle due to liquefaction, we would just look at the total settlement and say, oh, the building settled X amount. Dasty and Bray came in and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's different contributions to that total settlement. You know, we, we've already mentioned the volumetric strain that happens. And, and volumetric strain is simply the soil particles getting closer together, squeezing the water out during the shaking and hence it's volumetric. But we also have, um, there is um, shear based deformations. So um, the earthquake is, is rattling this structure back and forth too. And so as that structure rattles back and forth, each one of those footings is also tipping and rocking and, and jerking and shifting and that's going to cause them to wiggle downwards inducing their own little bearing capacity issues in underneath each of those footings so that that wiggling that that ratcheting downward is, is all a shear based mechanism it has nothing to do with volumetric strains in the soil it's it's all shear based we have um, reconsolidation of the soil. So once all of this material pans out and all those excess pore pressures go away um, in this sand layer, it's normally consolidated again. It's, it's basically, for, from Mother Nature's point of view, it's a brand new soil. And it's got all of this load on top of it that it needs to consolidate under now. And so it will consolidate um, underneath those loads. And then fourth and finally, I thought this was an interesting one. Um, quite often, what you'll see um, is these little sand volcanoes um, on the ground surface where soil liquefaction occurs. I'm doing my best to draw them. It's kind of hard. I've never drawn these uh, sand boils before on a sketch. But um, they happen because this sand is that's pressurized from the liquefaction is trying to find a means to escape. So it escapes and it flows up to the ground surface and it just spews out all over the ground surface up here. Well, all of that material that's spewing out from beneath that building is volume, it's material that was beneath the building before it. And so because it's spewing out, um, we're losing material beneath the building and that is going to cause additional settlement of that building. So um, what would we call this, uh, ejecta? So Dasty and Bray basically, to, to summarize it, said, hey, look, your settlement beneath buildings is a complicated thing. And it, it, it's comprised of all these different components. And we are getting to the point now, I mean, just, just in 2019, a couple of models were developed. Bray with another PhD student, Jorge Macedo, 
uh, published a model to predict these types of combined settlements beneath buildings. And then Dashti, with one of her PhD students and some others uh, involved in that project, I was a co-author on that paper as well, also published an alternative model for computing settlements beneath buildings from liquefaction. That one was Bullock, Dashti, and others published in 2019 in Geotechnique. So the, vol or the, the moral of this volumetric story is we're only looking at this one. And it's the one that most engineers only look at. Um, generally, these other ones beneath buildings, we, we sometimes ignore. And we shouldn't be doing that anymore. But that's a different story. OK, so how do we estimate seismic compaction or volumetric strains uh, from pre-filled liquefaction settlements. And it, so there's lots of different models that are out there that have been developed that have been based on laboratory cyclic shear testing of clean sands and they've estimated or, or they've measured the amount of volumetric strain that occurred after they liquefied the sand. So Tokimatsu Seed, Ishihara Yoshimi, Nishimoto, Wu and Seed, Chetan and others and many many others now, most engineers today use um, one of the original methods that uh, was very, very popularized because it was so simple. And, and trust me, anything that Ishihara did um, was, was like gold. That guy did wonderful laboratory work, and he really is a legend in this, in this field. And so um, his work and his curves that he did with Yoshimini have survived the test of time. And so most engineers today use Ishihara and Yoshimini. And uh, so when we talk about volumetric strains, then this is the curve that Ishihara and Yoshimini developed. It's a function of the factor of safety of liquefaction and uh, the Japanese version of SPT resistance, N172. So um, we have curves that, that have been Americanized that, that have modifications to these curves due to N160 instead of N172. But you get the drift. It Basically, it's a function of the factor of safety against liquefaction, some um, proxy for relative density uh, as a function of SPT resistance, and then your corresponding volumetric strain that you're grabbing. Now, um, before I get to these big fancy equations, okay, uh, when we talk about strain, um, everybody knows this this function, right? You've all learned it in your materials courses, or displacement U equals P L over A E. That's if I have like a a, a bar of material that's under some um, stress equal to P and my bar length is L, it has a cross-sectional area of A, um, and a modulus of elasticity of um, E. So if, if we have a material of elastic modulus E, and, and we load it with uh, a force P, and all that stuff, we can, come, we can predict a displacement. But all of that is based off this fundamental law, that the stress, the normal stress on this material, which is essentially P over A, is equal to um, the modulus of elasticity times the, the strain of the material. Okay. And so from this fundamental relationship, we can, um, if we transmit this to soil, we can say if I have a, a soil layer that is, is um, we can call it L thick, then we could say then that the, the settlement, um, I'll call it S, is simply equal to the strain times the, um, the length or the, the thickness of my soil layer. So all I need to do is, is if I want the settlement, I need to come up with the strain that is uh, going to be present in my soil layer. 
And that is what the volumetric strain is from all these relationships. So it, it became this theory then that you could take these relationships and say the settlement is going to be the summation from, um, you know, for the number of layers uh, for I equals one of the volumetric strain uh, or I times the thickness of layer I. And so if you just summed up the strain in all of your layers, you would get your total settlement of the ground surface. Now it's a nice theory and everybody seems to like it. The problem is it doesn't work. It doesn't work with real data once you measure it in the field. And so what other researchers have done, researchers like Zhuang uh, at 2013 and others, uh, have come along and they've taken actual case histories of settlements, liquefaction settlements in the field. They've, they've developed soil layers from the, the CPTs they pushed at uh, each of those sites. And then they um, applied this simplified method of, of predicting the settlement from the different strains. And they saw how far off their predicted settlements were from the actual settlements that occurred. And then they produced um, basically fudge functions. Think of these as uh, like the settlement corrected would equal some fudge factor M times the, the settlement that you predicted from your, your typical layer. And then it might even have some other fudge factor in the form of a constant, like plus b or something. So this is all just to, to correct bias. So Zhuang et al. did this type of correction, this bias correction, to correct this methodology for the purpose of, a, of predicting free fields volumetric strain settlements using the CPT. Now here's the procedure. For each row of the CPT, you have to estimate your volumetric strain. This comes from those Ishihara and Yoshimini curves. But rather than you manually having to go to a figure and, and, and scaling off a value for <coughs> the hundreds of layers that are in your CPT, they digitize the curves and they develop these relationships right here just with an equation. So this is the type of thing you can put into a spreadsheet and it's very, very, very easy to do. So with that, you can estimate your volumetric strain for every single layer. And notice, by the way, it, it's, it's a function, of course, of your factor of safety, which for Zhuang and others, they recommended using the, um, the Robertson and Ride method for computing the factor of safety. In this research, we did Robertson and Ride, and we also did the Boulanger and Idris CPT method. The second step is that for each row in the CPT, you have to calculate what Zhuang called an indicator variable. The indicator variable is like an on-off switch. I'm going to do my best to draw a little light switch here. Um, that's terrible. But you know, you've seen light switches in house. It can flip on or it can flip off and it will turn the light on or turn the light off. That's the same thing we're doing here. The indicator variable means the, the layer is turning on, meaning it's susceptible to settlements, or it's turning off, which means it's not susceptible. And they've made it a function of the probability of liquefaction, which makes sense. The probability of liquefaction is zero. Why would we expect any liquefaction settlements to occur in that later? If, conversely, the probability of liquefaction was equal to one, we would definitely expect settlements to occur in that layer. So the indicator variable from Zhuang and others, IND, is the same thing as the probability of liquefaction, and they give it as this equation right here, which comes from an earlier paper that they published uh, by Ku and, and others, uh, estimating the probability of liquefaction from the, the Robertson and Ride CPT data set. And then finally, here's the corrected settlement from the soil profile. So this is that bias fudge factor I, I was telling you about, times the strain for the layer, times the thickness of the layer. That was like the L that we I mentioned in my sketch before, 
times the probability of liquefaction for that layer. So you sum all those up and you get your settlement for your layer. Now, um, they've reported a bias correction factor in, in the Zhuang and others paper. We um, didn't like some of the assumptions that they made and we describe um, the modifications that we made. Very, it was very minor, very simple modification, but it simplified the calculation immensely for um, accounting for uncertainty in the standard deviations in these models. So um, we modified the bias correction factor slightly based on going back and looking at their data again. Um, but by, by modifying it slightly, it's like less than a 10% modification. Um, so we recommend a bias correction factor of 1.014, which is almost a factor of one when you think about it. Um, and then we also computed, um, using the assumptions that we did, that the standard deviation, in other words, the error, or the scatter, um, in predicting accurately the case histories from the field was 0.3313. Okay. Now, um, one of the things about the CPT, when you push a cone penetration test, is that you're collecting continuous data, essentially. Um, but because um, you're, you're pushing through lots of different layers of soil and there's transitions as you go from layer to layer, there's various corrections that some engineers like to apply to their CPT soundings before they do any type of analysis with them. And um, Dr. Peter Robertson is one of the leading, uh, the world leading experts in the cone penetration test, has recommended in several of his papers and numerous of his talks uh, on, on multiple occasions that CPT soundings uh, often should be modified and corrected for uh, some of these different effects that come into the CPT. And so I'm not going to dive into the details of these various corrections, but a lot of these are outlined in uh, various, um, I would say, landmark pioneering papers that are, are very well known in the, in the earthquake engineering community. So, for instance, that would be the Yaud and Others 2001 liquefaction paper, also known as the NSEER method. Uh, so some of these uh, effects are described in there. The thin layer correction, for instance, is uh, because the, the, the CPT doesn't have the ability to read very fine layers very well. Um, it, it's picking up the traces of layers beneath these thin layers. Um, and, and so as such, uh, we can try to correct the data that we measure for these thin layers. We, um, very, very closely related when you transition from a soft layer into a hard layer or a hard layer into a soft layer, uh, it doesn't read very accurately with the CPT. And so there are various forms of layer transitions. Now in, in this research, we did the very basic one that's been around for 20 years for Yaud and others. I know that, uh, for instance, Ross Boulanger and Jason DeYoung have uh, recently published a new um, inverse filtering method to correct for layer transitions um, and, and that's great. Um, you're certainly welcome to correct your data using that method um, instead of the one we built in to the spreadsheets that I'll talk about later but um, I certainly wouldn't do both let's just put it that way. Um, and then finally, another one that uh, Robertson strongly recommended was a depth weighting factor. And, and this really comes from research that was done by Chet and, and Seed and others out of Berkeley where they, they observed that when you have uh, volumetric strains at very deep depths, uh, those strains don't quite propagate all the way to the ground surface because the soil begins to bridge. By bridge, what I mean, that's the same phenomenon that allows you, for instance, to tunnel in the soil and not allow the, and not have the soil collapse on the tunnel that you just dug. So the soil begins to take the stress of the hole or the void that you just created. So um, 
the deeper the volumetric strain is, the, like, the, the higher the likelihood that the soil above it will start to bridge that, that gap or that, that strain that formed in the soil. So the closer the strain is to the ground surface, the more likely you'll see it on the ground surface. The deeper you are, the less likely you are to see that strain on the ground surface. So um, Chetton and others, uh, in their modeling, they observed that that, that depth at which uh, the soil be really begins to bridge is about 18 meters below the ground surface. Any settlements that occur below 18 meters, you won't see them on the ground surface because the soil bridges. So they do a weighting function that the closer you are to 18 meters, the less those settlements contribute to the settlements of the ground surface. And the higher you are, or the closer you are to the ground surface, the more those settlements contribute to the settlements of the ground surface. So it's just a simple linear weighting function that you can read about in more detail in Chetton and others 2009. Now uh, the spreadsheets and the tools that we developed for this research, uh, CPT -lick, uh, CPT Lick, that uh, we'll describe in a later lecture, they have these options for correcting uh, your CPTs built into them, uh, but you can turn them on or off as you like. So if you don't want to put in any of these corrections, you don't have to. Okay, and of all of these factors, by the way, um, through the research we did, we found that uh, of those three, that the depth weighting factor, it, it carries the most punch in reducing your predicted settlements. And, and by the way, um, I, I neglected to mention verbally that um, when you apply these corrections, you are going to reduce your settlements. So uh, check out these box and whisker plots. Um, these are from the different um, triggering methods, Idris and Boulanger or Robertson. Um, and this R, okay, is the ratio of the corrected, I'm sorry, let me do this, is the settlement of the corrected CPT divided by the settlement from the um, uncorrected. So it's just the ratio of the settlements. So you see when, for instance, I apply the depth factor correction, the depth weighting factor, on average, I reduce my predicted settlements somewhere right around 55 to 60 percent. That's insane. That's crazy. Or that ratio, I mean, is 55 to 60 percent. So we, we reduce the predicted settlements substantially. If all I did was a thin layer correction, we reduce the, the predicted settlements by less than 10 percent on average. And if I do them both, uh, we reduce the predicted settlements by about 50 percent on average. So, um, yeah, 45 to 50 percent. So you can see then the, the effects of, of doing these optional CPT corrections to the soundings before you analyze them. Okay, let's move on to lateral spread. Um, of all the topics I could talk about, lateral spread is well, the one that I, I'm probably the most comfortable speaking with you about because it's the topic that, that I've been studying now for about 17 years, ever since my master's degree. Uh, it's a very fascinating topic, and lateral spread is indeed understood to be one of the most damaging of the hazards associated with earthquakes and liquefaction because it, it poses tremendous risk to lifelines, things like bridges, ports, roads, and railways, and um, pipelines, other lifelines, oh, anything, anything that um, doesn't like to be stretched, basically and lateral spread will cause problems. So the, the mechanics of lateral spread work like this. So let's say I, this is a cross section of a bridge built on a, a drilled shaft foundation. You can see the dense sand, the loose sand, an overlying clay, clay crust, and then we may even have some um, fill that we place to, to get a nice level road surface for our, our uh, approach to our bridge. So if an earthquake happens, and that soil liquefies, 
uh, there's some already some existing shear stresses in that soil and, and because we have an open face over here um, from the river channel or the ocean or whatever there's no resistance to prevent that soil from wanting to settle and move in that direction where there's no resistance so because of that we have this downslope movement of this clay crust and embankment fill on top of this weakened or softened liquefied soil. And as a result, we can end up with cracks, we can end up with boils uh, all over. Typically, that's what we'd see are these sand boils um, all over these cracks and, and just a mess all over the ground surface. We'd see um, that the ground shifted in the direction of the river that uh, maybe caused damage to the bridge. And in some cases, we even see these bridge decks buckling. And then we also see the damage to the, the deep foundations as well uh, because of the movements in that liquefied soil. So that, my friends, is what lateral spread looks like. Now there's a real bridge. Now granted, this looks like Uncle Billy's backyard bridge. Uh, this, uh, you know, this is 1964 Alaska. So. Uh, this is actually a, a major highway back in that day um, and it was one of the more heavily traveled roads back then and you can see that it was damaged substantially from lateral spread of the ground moving into the river channel and it buckled the bridge. So when, as engineers analyze lateral spread there, there's two general approaches to computing or predicting these lateral spreads. The first one are called analytical methods, but these are now beginning to be called more commonly numerical methods. So these methods deal with computation. They deal with taking physical physical based or physics based models, maybe stress strain relationships, um, and, and then predicting using physics and math what the outcome is going to be numerically. So it may often involve finite element analysis. A more simplistic uh, form that's pretty commonly used are things like Newmark sliding block methods, which uh, inherently are analytical because they're, they're based on a physical theory uh, of the laws of physics. Now, um, these, these models used to be pretty complex and difficult, but as these numerical approaches become more and more uh, ac acceptable, uh, practical, applicable every year, they're getting easier and easier to do. So someday these methods are going to be keen, but not yet. Today most people still use empirical methods or semi-empirical methods to predict their lateral spread displacements. These are solely based on um, case histories of lateral spread from the field to which statistical models have been fit and then you just use those equations or those models to predict uh, the, the lateral spread. Now a semi-empirical model is one in which um, a, a, a physical theory or a physics-based theory uh, is, is the governing equation uh, in, in the model but then that theory is applied to a set of lateral spread case histories and the model coefficients and the correction factors and such are statistically regressed from that model data or from that case history data and so uh, it's called semi-empirical because uh, the model is, is, is like a hybrid analytical and empirical model. So when we talk about predicting lateral spreads using the CPT, um, we've, we've got a long ways to go, I'm not going to lie. Um, the, the most commonly used model was published in 2004, about 17 years ago. It, it is a semi-empirical model uh, published by um, Zhang Robertson and others. Zhang was uh, Robertson's PhD student. And it was really based on seven CPT lateral spread points. Not seven events, seven points. Uh, they had a lot more SPT data than they had CPT data. But it was one of the first, if not the first, lateral spread model published for the CPT. 
And the engineering world was hungry for a model using the CPT. So as such, they clung to it, and they've been using it ever since. Now, Idris and Boulanger also present their own semi-empirical lateral spread model um, that I've, I'm aware of, of some people like liking to use. Um, it was not necessarily peer-reviewed, and, and it's not as robust or contain as many case histories uh, as the Zhang and others one, as far as I'm aware. But it's based on the same fundamental theory, where um, it's, it's basically lateral displacement is equal to the shear strain of the soil times the, again, the thickness of the soil. So similar to volumetric strain, but this time it's the shear strain of the soil times its thickness, and that gives us the lateral displacement. That's Idris and Boulanger. But we're not going to discuss Idris and Boulanger in this presentation. We're going to discuss Zhang and others. So the Zhang and others case or, or semi-empirical model is uh, follows the pattern established by uh, Bartlett and Yaud, uh, where they define whether a case is either a free face or a ground slope case. Ground slope case means that you just have a constant or a nearly constant slope gradient. And a free face case is that you have a either level ground or nearly level ground uh, adjacent to what they call a free face. This is like a canal, a river channel, or even a, a key wall or something like that. So this is what a free face looks like. Now, um, for characterizing the site geometry for the Zhang and others model, you take the ratio L over H, where L is the distance from the toe of the free face to your site. Not the, the actual distance like that, but the horizontal distance from the toe to um, wherever your site is located. And then H is the height of the free face. The model is supposedly valid for L over H ratios of 4 to 40. Okay, now Zhang and others, they uh, just like with uh, settlements, they rely on Ishihara and Yoshimini's data, but instead of using volumetric strains, it is maximum cyclic shear strains, gamma. And these are the curves that Ishihara and Yoshimini developed that are, again, a function of factor of safety, relative density of the soil, and uh, to give you the corresponding cyclic shear strain. Whoops, I'm not sure why that shrunk. There we go. So here are the steps for the Zhang and others procedure for computing lateral spread with the CPT. So what they recommend doing is first computing what they call the lateral displacement index, or the LDI. And all it is is the summation of the thickness of each little layer times its corresponding um, shear strain. So it, it's, it's basically the, the, the initial estimate of lateral spread displacement. That's what the LDI is. Okay, So this figure demonstrates it. This comes from the Zhang and others paper where you can see tip resistance for a site. You can see the, the, the friction ratio of the site. You see the corrected tip resistance, equivalent clean sand. Um, and then the, the factor of safety in this case, computed with the Robertson and Ride method. From that factor of safety, um, using Ishihara and Yoshimini, they computed corresponding uh, shear strains. And then from those shear strains, they computed LDI. And you can see it's a summation. So it just as you go from the bottom um, all the way up to the top of the sounding to the ground surface, the LDI accumulates. So once you have the LDI uh, for your soil profile, now this is where the semi-empirical part comes in. This is all the, um, the analytical stuff. This is all the empirical stuff. So they fit it to empirical case histories. Uh, 
Um, so if you're using a gently sloping ground or a ground slope case, this is the relationship you're going to use. So now we have um, the slope of the ground plus uh, a model coefficient uh, times the LDI that you have. And S is in percent. Or if you have a free face case, you're going to use this relationship right here. Okay. So here are the limitations that Zhang and others recommend uh, for using their model. Uh, and, and again, you know, these magnitudes are just simply from all the earthquakes uh, f from the case histories in their event and the corresponding PGAs that are in there. Um, so you can see with these pretty small ranges, it's very easy to, um, very, very easy to extrapolate. Um, or, uh, yeah, to extrapolate with uh, this model. And so um, there, there really is need for a, a, an updated and an expanded lateral spread model for the CPT, especially given the massive amount of data that we have today as compared to the early 2000s when this model was originally developed. Fortunately, one of our objectives in the future research uh, associated with the Next Generation Liquefaction Project is to develop such methods. So that will be coming in the next few years, and we're looking forward to it. Okay, just like with volumetric strains, when we deal with the lateral displacement index, um, Dr. Robertson, and the guru of lateral spread himself, Dr. T. Leslie Yowd, have recommended on several occasions modifications to the CPT sounding to account for soil conditions that aren't captured in the CPT or that don't represent the clean sands that are required for using the Ishihara and Yoshimini data. So um, I had a student, a graduate student, look at some of these corrections about two years ago and we're in the process of writing up a paper that we'll submit for peer review and hopefully get out and published in the journal in the next uh, year or two. Um, so it, it's under preparation right now. Uh, but in our technical report, we do summarize um, some of these corrections. Uh, some of these you've already seen before, the thin layer correction, layer transition, and depth weighting factor. So I won't address those again. But I'll address these other two. So for instance, the depth of the lateral spread um, with the free face. So if I were to draw a free face profile, so here's my water. Here's my site located over here. And let's say that I have a liquefiable layer down here beneath my river channel. Now, some people may look at this and go, wow, if this layer liquefies, then it wouldn't be feasible for lateral spread to occur up top because we have this soil at the bottom of the river channel that's acting like a buttress that's not liquefied and it's preventing the soil from moving. And the answer is sort of. Sort of. Um, we've learned from our own empirical experience and, and, and Professor Yaud, I should correctly state, has learned from his experience in studying more lateral spreads on the planet than probably anyone else alive that you can have lateral spread in this case. You can get bulging or, or buckling of this, this buttressing soil, the bottom of the river channel. So what he's observed is, and, and this is his rule of thumb, if, if you have a free face height that is equal to H, that you can, tran you can project that same distance, H, beneath the bottom of the toe of the free face, and as long as the liquefiable layer is within that distance, uh, Professor Yao says, yes, uh, it is applicable to the lateral spread analysis. But if it's down here, below that depth H, below the free face, Professor Yao says, no, it will not contribute to lateral spread in this river channel. So if you turn on this correction option, it will only consider soils
located uh, from a depth h below the toe of the free face all the way up to the ground surface. Anything below that depth, it does not count. And then, getting back to fundamental soil mechanics, uh, the, the final parameter that, that these great uh, engineers have, have uh, suggested may come into play is uh, just looking at the state parameter of that soil layer in question and whether that soil is contractive or dilative depending on where it's located relative to the steady state or the critical state line. So uh, this, would this would require then that you have an estimate of the critical state line for every layer of soil in your, in your CPT sounding. Now um, Robertson or Bean and Jeffries, or Robertson points out that Bean and Jeffries have shown that uh, a corrected tip resistance of about 70 is approximately equal to the critical state line for all sands measured in a CPT. So um, we can we can basically state then that if anything that is dilative or anything that um, is greater than that QTNCS of 70, we would remove it and say, nope, it's, it's not susceptible to lateral spread. So these are different than corrections that you can apply. Um, and uh, if you do apply them, then uh, it will reduce your predicted lateral spread substantially. All right, that wraps up this lesson. Um, in the next lesson, we're going to jump into a crash course summary of the idea of performance-based earthquake engineering and, and how it applies to liquefaction specifically. Um, after that lesson, we're going to move into uh, the research that we developed, which was developing a simplified approximation of the performance-based liquefaction hazard assessment. So thanks for your attention in this lesson, and I hope to see you in the next lesson where we talk about performance-based engineering.